Uh, good evening. Welcome to the public lecture of the Institute for Mathematical Sciences at the NUS uh, this evening. My name is Tong Chita. I'm the director of the Institute. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce the speaker for this evening, Professor Stephen Simpson from Pennsylvania State University. I have known Steve, Steve since the time when I was a graduate student. I've known Steve since the time when I was a graduate student. Okay, actually, it was in my second year. And uh, Steve uh, had just become a postdoc. A postdoc uh, with a PhD fresh from MIT. And I remember that Steve stayed at Yale at the McDowell for only one year. But uh, I remember that I asked him many questions about uh, subject of mathematical logic, and I would say that he was, uh, he could qualify as, as a, certainly as a teacher, whom I learned a lot of uh, things about the uh, subject of, of uh, logic. A year later, he moved to Berkeley, and uh, after that, okay, he joined the mathematics department at Penn State, and uh, has been a professor there ever since. Now, Steve is uh, one of the logicians, uh, I would say in the last century, who, was, uh, who made fundamental contributions to the subject that today we call uh, reverse mathematics. In fact, he was one of the pioneers, uh, one of the key figures who uh, drove the subject to its current state. Where, for example, today at the IMS, we have this uh, workshop called New Challenges in Reverse Mathematics. And Steve Simpson's name has been associated with the subject for since the beginning uh, of the, since the birth of the subject in, in the 1980s. Well, Steve was, I remember, uh, he was a student of Gerald Sachs at MIT, and Gerald Sachs used to say that there was a period in which he would call the golden theory of logic at MIT, and Steve was certainly one of the <coughs> most uh, brilliant students who are contributed to that term coined by Sachs. But apart from reverse mathematics, Steve has also made significant contributions to the study of what one calls the global theory of uh, green degrees. In fact, he proved a fundamental result in, that was published in the, in the 1970s that, that characterized that actually found the complexity, identified the complexity of the theory of the <coughs> theory, and that sparked the uh, study. Uh, I would say a new chapter in, in the study of that uh, topic. So today we are very happy that Steve Simpson has uh, accepted the invitation to give a public lecture on a subject that I believe is very close to his heart foundations of mathematics and how one gives the best mathematics. Please welcome Professor Simpson. Uh, 
Singapore and, and NUS and, and the Institute for Mathematical Sciences here at NUS many times. I, I always enjoy it. And uh, it's a pleasure also to uh, uh, you know, uh, renew acquaintance with many colleagues who are here, um, and especially uh, C.T. Chung, who's, uh, who's an old friend. Uh, also himself a very uh, great contributor to uh, many many parts of mathematical logic, including reverse mathematics. Um, and so yeah, today, um, but I'm basically a mathematics professor, and so I'll do what professors do, which is try to explain a little bit about uh, my uh, research area. And. I'll be talking about these two gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, David Hilbert, who was the, the great, I'd say, the greatest mathematician of the early 20th century. Uh, uh, in, he's European, German, uh, and uh, just a very great mathematician in many different branches of mathematics, including foundations of mathematics. And this is uh, uh, another famous figure, Kurt. Gödel, who was a, uh, a, a, a uh, probably the greatest logician of the 20th century, um, uh, I know that uh, Gödel and Turing, the inventor of the digital computer, were uh, identified in Time magazine at the end of the 20th century as two two of the 20 great thinkers of the 20th century, and those. The only, those two were the only two mathematicians in that list. Um, uh, and then I want to talk, uh, I want to, so I'll be talking about the, the ideas of these two men in the early 20th century, and I'll jump back and forth to ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, so I'll be jumping back and forth between ancient Greece and the early 20th century. Uh, and talk about foundations of mathematics, and then I'll talk about modern things, only at the end. So, um, so my research area, as I said, is mathematical logic and foundations of mathematics. And uh, I've written out my talk here. I don't usually do this, but uh, this is such an occasion that I, I wrote out. I, I actually wrote out my talk, so so I'm going to read it. Uh, so throughout history. Uh, mathematics and logic have been regarded as uh, not only as indispensable components of all of the other sciences, of course they are, logic and mathematics are essential for all science, but uh, also as role models for science because uh, mathematics is often regarded as the most objective and most logically perfect of all the sciences. There's, there's no there, there's logical perfection there, and and uh, and objectivity. If something is mathematically true, it's true. That's it, right? That's at least the standard the conventional wisdom. And uh, this has been the case for many many centuries that people viewed mathematics in this way. Uh, so scientists throughout history, therefore, have thought it that it's particularly important to understand the logical structure of mathematics. What is the logical structure of mathematics? And that's what uh, this research area is. Foundations of mathematics is basically, it's the study of the most basic concepts in mathematics and the logical structure of mathematics. And you try to clarify the, the most basic concepts. Uh, at some point you have to stop because you, 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 to, if you want to clarify a concept, you have to clarify it in terms of more basic concepts. And eventually this process has to stop with the most basic concepts. So that's what Foundations of Mathematics is about. Trying to understand the logical structure and basic concepts of mathematics. And um, now, mathematics is an ancient science uh, which has evolved and continues to evolve over time. And so there's a long history here going back uh, uh, thousands of years. And uh, throughout history, there have been a number of what are, what are called foundational crises, that is, times when there was a crisis in mathematics and the foundations of mathematics, when, times when there was profound doubt about the logical basis of mathematics. Um, we don't, you know, maybe 
some of you are undoubtedly mathematics students, maybe you don't know this, but at different times in history, not always, but at, at certain times in history that have been, uh, there have been a lot of doubts about the, the nature of mathematics. And uh, some of these doubts have centered on the concept of infinity. What is, what is, what do we really mean by an infinite set or an infinite object? Do, or does it make, does anything, is, is there anything that's objectively infinite from an objective point of view? Um, uh, you know, in the, in the real world, is there anything that's infinite? Uh, so, so uh, I'll be commenting a lot on, on, the, on the question of infinity. So let me start with uh, this quote from Hilbert. It's here, and uh, let's see, uh, it's here on this poster. The infinite, no other question has ever moved so profoundly the spirit of man. He's saying that the infinite is something that we can get all mushy about. It's, it's, we're, just, we're, we're really moved by this concept. <laughs> um, now, why would he say that? Well, I'll return to that later. I mean, you know, because there are lots of finite things that we care about a lot, too, you know. Um, but, um, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, you know, our, wealth, our families, our bank accounts, you know, all kinds of things. But, finite things. But, but the, the infinite is, is, is he, he claims that the infinite has moved profoundly the spirit of man. So, I'll, I'll say a little about that later. Uh, after commenting a little bit on the role of the infinite in mathematics. So Hilbert wrote a famous essay on the infinite, which was a mature and definitive statement of his plan to place mathematics on a firm, solid, objective, logical foundation. But why was there even a need for foundations of mathematics? Why, why is this a question? In, as I said before, mathematics is normally regarded as the most basic, most certain, most logically perfect of all the sciences, why, why, why should there be any doubt about it, about its foundations? It's the science of measurement and quantity, and it's an essential component for all, of, all the sciences. And it has, it, it, by the way, mathematics not only is essential for all the sciences, but it's been viewed uh, often as a laboratory for intellectual training. You know, in other words, it's, you, you, you send your students to learn, you send your, your children to learn mathematics partly because it's good mental training, right? And uh, even in the, uh, ancient, among the ancient Greeks, this was, uh, there was uh, some, something like this going on. Among the ancient Greek thinkers such as Plato, rigorous training in mathematics was regarded as an indispensable prerequisite for all serious intellectual activity. You had to be a math. You had to be trained in mathematics just to do anything serious, in in uh, according to Plato, uh, in, in intellect of, a, of an intellectual kind, and that applies not only to math obviously mathematical subjects uh, such as you know uh, 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 architecture or engineering, but but uh, but also to law, politics, ethics, everything, uh, mathematical training was required according to Plato. Uh, above the gateway entrance to Plato's academy, the, the great school of Plato in, the, in ancient Greece, there was inscribed a phrase, let none but geometers enter here. So in other words, if you, if you didn't know geometry, which was synonymous with mathematics at that time, you, you weren't even supposed to enter the academy. You know, I mean, now this story may be unverifiable, but this may be just a story. But but it's true in spirit. I mean, this because if you read Plato's writings and the writings of a lot of ancient Greeks, they placed a lot of store on mathematics. Mathematics was very important to them, and it still is. You know, for the uh, great uh, Renaissance philosophers such as Descartes, I mean, they were mathematics was extremely important. Played a great role in their thinking. Um, and the point is that mathematics, perhaps more so than other sciences, deals in powerful but precisely defined abstractions, uh, you know, very uh, abstract concepts, 
So by developing our ability to handle mathematical abstractions correctly, we can also develop our ability to handle abstractions in other areas such as philosophy, law, politics, and even ethics. That's, that's, that's the spirit of Plato's uh, writings. Uh, you know, mathematics is training and handling abstractions or the ideal element, the ideal things that Plato wanted to talk about. Uh, so, uh, in an era when, so again, uh, why did Hilbert, in, so going back to the 20th century, this was an era when, this was a time when mathematics was flourishing, it was, it was just growing in all directions. Late 19th, early 20th century was a great period in mathematics. And so mathematics was flourishing, but why at that time were great mathematicians such as Hilbert concerned about the foundations of mathematics, that is the most basic concept in logical structure? Why did they feel a need to worry about that or to shore up the foundations? And the answer is, even as mathematics was flowering, some of the newer and more abstract mathematical concepts uh, became a little bit hard to accept. They, they became hard to swallow. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk, talk about, they, they just made people uneasy. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. But there was a real concern that mathematics was moving into some kind of a twilight zone. Uh, so, um, and you know, there were big controversies in the foundations of mathematics at the time. And lots of, lots of things were going on then. Uh, this kind of unease had a precedent. Now let me jump back to ancient Greece. This kind of unease had a precedent in ancient Greece. Um, so this is more than 2,500 years ago. The philosophical school of Pythagoras was obsessed with pure numbers. Let's see if I can. Uh, so this is a picture of, uh, this is what it was like in ancient Greece. <laughs> well, maybe not everywhere, but this is this is um, uh, this is a. Uh, let me see if I can. No, I don't want to fool around with the computer, but I I could enlarge that picture. This picture, the, the life size picture of this is is uh, the the actual fresco. Uh, and so it's called the School of Athens. Uh, it's by the great uh, Italian Renaissance artist Raffaello or Raphael. Um, and. Um, it's a fresco that is in the Vatican. It's, uh, I looked it up, it's, it's uh, 500 centimeters high and 770 centimeters wide. It's big. And uh, he, he has this panorama of all the great uh, thinkers in ancient Greece, the great philosophers and, and, and mathematicians. Uh, this one here is uh, reputed to be Pythagoras. And many of the others, it's just guesswork at who they really are. But the two in the middle, I want to comment on. That's Plato and Aristotle, for sure. Uh, and uh, we'll comment on that. But anyway, Pythagoras uh, started a school of mathematics and a school of philosophy. And they were obsessed with pure numbers. Philosophy and mathematics went hand in hand. And um, so consider, for example, uh, they, they, they thought a lot about pure numbers, and uh, let's see. So consider a square, just a, a diagram here, a square. That's, that's supposed to be a perfect square. There's four sides marked, uh, marked S, and there's a diagonal marked D. And uh, there's a number called by, called by this symbol, it's, the, it's called, it, you read it as the square root of 2. Um, so that number is the ratio of D divided by S. So in other words, D, you can see that it's a little bit bigger than S, but it's smaller than 2 times S. So, it's some, so the ratio would be somewhere between 1 and 2. And uh, that it's, but it's an actual number. It's it's not a whole number, of course. It's a it's a it's a it's a uh, number somewhere between one and two. And uh, then you talk about approximating this number. What is this number? Can we can we give an exact explanation of what this number is? Well, the the most common way of representing numbers is as fractions of whole numbers. You divide. Take a whole number divided by another whole number. That's the most 
uh, it, other than whole numbers themselves, those are the most common uh, way of representing a number as a fraction. And uh, so the square root of 2 is um, actually, this, this happens to be a very good approximation. 99 divided by 70 is, is a pretty good approximation to some maybe four decimal places of, of the square root of 2. And uh, 99 divided by 70, and this number, 665,857 divided by 470,832, that's an even better approximation. Okay, but they, what, what the Pythagoreans discovered was that there is no way to express the square root of 2 exactly in that form, at, at one whole number divided by another whole number. There's no way to, there, the square root of 2 cannot be expressed in this, in, in this manner. Uh, so, so this was, uh, uh, i go back to my text here. There's no way to express it exactly as a ratio of uh, whole numbers. Uh, so it is the first example of what is now called an irrational number. Imagine that, an irrational number. Mathematics is supposed to be the most rational of sciences. Uh, the, word, the word irrational is just a pun. I mean, irrational just means it's not a ratio. It's not a ratio of whole numbers. But it also, it, you're also talking about the departure from reason, right? So, um, and, well, for whatever reason, the Pythagoreans, the school of Pythagoras, viewed this discovery as horrifying and subversive. They, uh, for a significant amount of time, they tried to keep the irrationality of the square root of two hidden as a deep, dark, esoteric secret known only to their exclusive group. They, they, didn't, they didn't tell people about this. They, did, they thought it would be, I guess they thought there would be, uh, you know, panic in the streets or something if they told people about this. So, uh, so uh, you know, this was the first big foundational crisis that I know of. Maybe in ancient Chinese mathematics there was, even before the Greeks, there were foundational crises. I just don't know enough about it. But, but this is a big foundational crisis. Um, okay, so eventually it sorted itself out and people accepted the idea of irrational numbers. But, um, yeah, well, here it square root of 2 is exactly equal to this decimal, but I put exactly in quotes because it's an infinite decimal. It's an infinite non-repeating decimal. You can't, you can't, uh, you know, you just, there's no way to express it except just to calculate it one digit at a time. So there's no, there's no pattern, no particular pattern into those digits. So moving forward through history, um, there has been a sequence of higher and higher mathematical abstractions, more and more remote from real-world measurements. At least the square root of 2 has something to do with real-world measurements, right? It's, you know, this, the diagonal of the square divided by the side. So that's, that's something to do with real-world stuff. But, but uh, people introduced uh, even new classes of numbers with names even worse than irrational, okay? Uh, the very phrase irrational number, of course, is a, is a challenge to the power of reason and science, but beyond the irrational numbers, 19th and 20th century mathematicians were introducing ever more remote abstractions, including num number, even in the realm of numbers. There are transcendental numbers, there are the imaginary numbers, there are the complex numbers, very complex, uh, hard to understand. There are the transfinite numbers. Uh, there are the uncountable, uncountable numbers. Can you imagine that? A number that's, un, that's not countable. Uh, uh, the inaccessible numbers. So far out there, we can't even reach them. And uh, the hyper inaccessible numbers. The ineffable numbers. It just goes on and on like this. Uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm, this is serious. I mean, the people who, who are, are mathematical logicians know what I'm talking about. There's a series of numbers that were introduced that are more and more abstract. So, uh, classes of numbers. Um, and um, also, e 
But let me say that each of these classes of numbers uh, involves an appeal to the infinite. Even the irrational, even the irrational numbers involve an appeal to the infinite because it's an infinite uh, decimal expansion. You're not repeating. There's no pattern. Okay, so so this this is the kind of thing that was going on, and, and naturally uh, people were uh, you know wondering what does this all mean? What is it? What are we talking about in reality? So uh, now I'll go back to ancient Greece again. Um, um, so throughout history, the tension between the abstract versus the concrete, or the infinite versus the finite, has been pondered deeply. And this, this tension between the abstract and the concrete, the infinite versus the finite, this is depicted graphically in this famous fresco here, the, the School of Athens. This is a picture, not the whole thing, but you see these two figures in the middle? That's Plato and Aristotle. And if you, if you look at what they're doing in there, of course they're walking and talking, they're walking through Athens or the school of Athens and they're among their Athenian colleagues debating. But what they are doing is they're debating the nature of the infinite versus the finite or the abstract versus the concrete. They really are doing that. You can see that in this picture. I'll show you. Uh, now this is a blow up of Plato and Aristotle, and the, the, the two figures at the center of the school of Athens. Now, look what Plato, this is Plato, the old man. He's pointing up towards the heavens, like this. That's what he's doing. He's pointing up to heaven. And what, what's Aristotle doing? Aristotle is going like this, gesturing strongly and benevolently over the earth. Okay? That's what he's saying. He's saying, no, 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 not up there, down here. Okay? <laughs> now that's, that's a that's a graphic illustration of a debate that went on in ancient Greece between uh, you know, various schools of philosophy about the infinite versus the finite, the, the abstract versus the concrete. So, um, and so this, is, this is a key issue. And uh, in, 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 this, in this context, you can understand Hilbert's statement about how the infinite has moved the spirit of man throughout the ages. Now, um, I'm going to have to speed up here, but Aristotle is um, arguably the greatest philosopher of all time. Uh, he wrote major treatises on all branches of mathematics, and uh, all branches of, of philosophy and science, everything else, you know, everything from psychology to uh, ethics, politics, and physics. And, um, one of his books is called The Metaphysics. It's a massive tome, hundreds of pages long. And in The Metaphysics, he, the purpose is to answer profound questions about the nature of existence. What does it really mean for something to exist? And um, a typical question discussed in The Metaphysics is, do abstractions exist in reality, or do they exist only in the human mind? So, are they objective or not? As part of The Metaphysics, he includes a thorough discussion of mathematical existence. Uh, books new and new, or M&M &M of the metaphysics, is, is a discussion of mathematical existence. And uh, it's, it's very subtle and nuanced, it's thorough. Um, and what he does in this, in, in this treatise on the foundations of mathematics, he, he, creates a con he fashions a compromise between the finite and the infinite. He, he says, uh, he doesn't reject the infinite completely. Uh, it's not like he only believes in finite things. He, he believes in the infinite, but there's a, there's a subtlety to it. So there, he, what he does is he distinguishes between two kinds of infinity, actual infinity and potential infinity. Or pot let me start with potential infinity. So potential infinity, and I'm just going to tell you in in brief, what Aristotle was saying about mathematics. So he's obviously, you can see from this picture, he's, he's interested in the real world, okay, the concrete things, not heaven. But 
but he's but he's, he's, he accepts the idea of the internet, uh, but 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 in a, in a certain limited way. So potential infinity is the kind of infinity associated with a process that can be repeated or continued indefinitely. Many processes of, these, of this kind can be observed in reality. For instance, there is the Earth turning on its axis. It just keeps turning, turning, and you know there's no end to it. There's no there's no uh, reason to think it will stop. You know, there's no limit to it. Um, there's the march of time. There's the planets revolving around the sun. Uh, and that there's a, a body moving in outer space, there's nothing to stop it, so it just keeps moving. Uh, there's, uh, right on Earth, there's a cycle of generations, you know, in other words, parents have children, who have other children, have other children. That just goes on forever, right? Or it's not, I mean, there's no obvious limit to it. Um, the accumulation of knowledge is uh, another good example. There's no limit to the amount of knowledge that can exist. Uh, well, that's an example, another example of potential infinity. And the accumulation of wealth also. There's no limit to the amount of uh, wealth that can be accumulated. So um, all of these processes can be continued without any foreseeable limit. And there are many examples of potential infinity of, in mathematics, of course. The most important example is the sequence of whole numbers. If I start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, dot, 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 the dots indicate we're just going on to potential infinity. And uh, another example is a potentially infinite sequence of smaller and smaller numbers, like uh, point one, point zero, one, point zero, zero, one, smaller and smaller. Uh, another example is the potentially infinite sequence of decimal approximations to the square root of 2. The process of computing more and more decimal digits of the square root of 2 can be continued indefinitely. And all of these potential infinities in mathematics and elsewhere play an important role of our understanding, in our understanding of the real world. You know, there's no better way to explain what's going on than to say it's potentially infinite in, in some of these things. Now, actual infinity, there, so there are two kinds of infinity, potential infinity and actual infinity. I'm just telling you what Aristotle said. But actual infinity is another kind of infinity, standing in contrast to potential infinity. And actual infinity is a completed infinite totality. Infinitely many things or infinitely much stuff has been gathered together in a, in a basket. That's what, that's what actual infinity is. So, in the, in the case of mathematics, as a mathematical example, imagine that we have we start enumerating the um, the uh, the whole numbers one two three four five etc. and then and we keep going until we finish. We actually finish doing finish that enumeration, and then we stop and we look back over all the numbers that we have enumerated. That's all of the whole numbers, and then we just place a marker there. And the marker that is usually used is the symbol omega, omega being the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So, uh, uh, so that stopping point is an example of actual infinity. It's completed infinite totality. The emphasis on the word completed infinite totality. It's, it's finished. It's not just potential, it's actual. Uh, all right, so the, the philosophical question at issue here is what kinds of infinity have an objective existence? Do potential infinities exist objectively? Do actual infinities exist objectively? Do they exist in the real world? And Aristotle comes down on the side of a rather compelling philosophical position. Aristotle's position is uh, that potential infinities are part of the objective existence, but actual infinities are not. That's what he says. So, and it makes a lot of sense, this idea, because in, uh, you know, there are many obvious examples in observable reality of, of potential infinities, as I mentioned a few, but there are no convincing examples of actual infinity in observable reality. 
And of course, Aristotle is interested in observable reality. So, um, so and throughout history, uh, so this position, I'm going to call it finitism, uh, Aristotelian finitism. Uh, it's, well, it's not a rejection of infinity completely. It's not a rejection of infinity. It's, it's not saying infinite things don't exist. It's saying infinite things exist, but they're only potentially infinite. The potentially infinite things exist, but, but there's other kind of infinite things, uh, uh, completed things don't exist. Uh, that's what he's saying. And so we'll call this finitism, but it, that's really not a perfect name for it. Um, so over the centuries, many thinkers have agreed with Aristotle's finitism simply because there are many obvious examples in observable reality um, of potential infinity, but none of an actual infinity. On the other hand, there have been some non-finitistic thinkers who disagreed with Aristotle, and they have, uh, some of them have endorsed a great variety of actual infinities, typically on the grounds that these actual infinities exist as an important component of theological thought, philosophical thought, or mathematical thought. Uh, now, I guess the Aristotelian answer to that would be, well, if things exist in thought, that's not the same as really existing, right? I mean, you can think something, and that doesn't mean it exists. But, uh, who knows? Anyway, that's the that's debate that's going on. So, um, now let me also say, I have to admit that the great majority of contemporary mathematicians and mathematical users of mathematics are, and, and even mathematicians themselves, are indifferent to these questions. I mean, they're, they're questions such as potential infinity versus actual infinity. They only want to carry on using mathematics as they always have, uh, follow the paradigms that they've always used, and uh, not, they don't want to get bogged down in philosophical issues. Uh, Okay, so that's ancient Greece. Let me let me stress that again. That finite, Aristotle's finitism does not reject all infinities. He fully Aristotle fully accepts Aristotelian finitism. Fully accepts the concept of potential infinity, while at the same time rejecting the concept of actual infinity. Okay, now let's fast forward to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We'll go back to the modern times. Let's see. Got. Um, this is Gödel and uh, Hilbert and Gödel again. Um, so, uh, so the, the, during this, especially the late nineteenth and early late late nineteenth century, mathematics was just expanding in all directions: differential equations, geometry, number theory, algebra. All of these subjects were just exploding and, and becoming uh, rich, very rich with. Uh, lots of new ideas. And as part of this tremendous flowering of mathematics, great strides were being made in the direction of mathematical rigor and logical precision. The work of Cauchy, Weierstrass, Dedekind, Peano, Frege, Cantor, Russell, Whitehead, and Zermelo uh, cleared the way toward a perfect logical framework for all of mathematics. So that's, that was something that uh, developed out of this, uh, this, at this period. A landmark there was a, was a treatise of uh, Hilbert, uh, David Hilbert, this great mathematician, the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, uh, the early 20th century, I would say, uh, and his assistant Ackermann, Wilhelm Ackermann, and they presented an elegant and completely symbolic formulation of the logical axioms and rules for what is now known as the predicate calculus. And so the, you have to understand the significance of this. Digital computers didn't exist at that time. But it was in some sense clear, because of this work of Hilbert and Ackerman and their predecessors, that all of mathematics could be fully formalized, which means that it can be thrown onto a digital computer. You can, you can, you can formalize it completely so that a computer can handle it. In other words, you can, you can convert it into symbols that can be manipulated by a computer, and the computer can, in various senses, uh, do mathematics or help you with mathematics. That, 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 uh, is, that is really only being realized now, but 
that vision, but but that that this was the onset of that. So mathematics can be formalized. Uh, later in the 20th century, levels of mathematical abstraction continued to increase with a great variety of actual infinities, as I mentioned, and consequently, due in part to the non-objective nature of these actual infinities, there were nagging and sometimes massive doubts about the validity of mathematics. This is the foundational crisis I was talking about. Uh, the philosopher Russell famously characterized mathematics as, quote, the science in which we never know what we are talking about, nor whether what we say is true. So he's saying, in mathematics, we don't know what we're talking about. And we don't know, we have no idea whether what we're saying is true. No. And uh, then there's the mathematical physicist Eugene Wigner, I guess, who declared that there is no rational explanation for the usefulness of mathematics in the physical science, sciences. He, he himself was a mathematical physicist. He believed that mathematics was useful in the physical sciences. And he didn't doubt that. But he said there's no rational explanation for it. There's no reason to believe it should be. It just is. We don't, we don't know why. <laughs> I mean, think of that. Uh, can you imagine somebody saying that? And then uh, there's a, another mathematician, Morris Klein, published an influential popular book entitled, quote, Mathematics, the Loss of Certainty. So mathematics is no longer certain, according to Klein. Now, none of these, these scientists were viewed as enemies of mathematics. They were viewed as merely raising legitimate doubts about the validity of mathematics. So. So this was a, there was a foundational crisis going on. And I, I want to talk about a key step in this, the, the, the ideas of Hilbert and Gödel. Um, so, uh, so, so let's talk about this question of finitism versus, uh, finitistic methods versus infinitistic methods. <coughs> finitistic methods uh, do not, exp I, I, I mean it in the sense of Aristotle, in other words, Potential infinities are okay. You can use potential infinities because, because uh, at any stage in its evolution, it's finite. Uh, okay, but but you can't. Uh, but uh, but the doubtful part is the actual infinities. So Hilbert himself had already, in, early in his career, made dramatic use of non-finitistic methods. Uh, he in, in a branch of mathematics called invariant theory. Uh, and uh, he, he, he in, a, in a sort of in-your-face way, he used infinitistic methods in an essential way uh, to uh, solve, to sort of show in a, in a sort of abstract way that uh, all problems in invariant theory had, uh, had uh, good solutions. But he did this in a very abstract way. So um, his, I, I can't go into it uh, the details, but other finitistically, math, finitistically minded mathematicians criticized Hilbert's method for you know, his use of actual infinity. For instance, the mathematician Gordon is reputed to have said, maybe he didn't say it actually, some people have told me he didn't actually say that. Another famous mathematician said it instead. But anyway, somebody said, Hilbert's work in this area was not mathematics, but rather theology. Um, and uh, later, uh, so Hilbert did this work when he was a young mathematician, but later at the peak of his career, when he was the top mathematician in the world, he argued forcefully for the acceptance of actual infinities. After all, he had used them himself in his early work. And, uh, you know, he said, one of his statements is, no one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. Think of it, paradise, heaven. And, and that Cantor has created. Now this paradise that he was talking about is a paradise that's full of, chock full of actual infinities. There's actual infinities running around all over the place. That's the, that's the paradise that he was talking about. No one shall expel us from this paradise. However, Hilbert also 
also appreciated very much the finitist point of view. And he saw, <coughs> he tried to reconcile the two viewpoints. He saw finitistic mathematics as the most indispensable part, the meaningful core of mathematics. And attempting to reconcile these two viewpoints, he developed a sophisticated plan whereby non-finitistic mathematics would be somehow reduced or justified in terms of finitistic mathematics that is validated in a fully finitistic way. Uh, there are three steps to this. It's a little technical. Step one is you have to use the idea of formalization. You, you formalize finitistic and non-finitistic mathematics as two distinct but logically, <coughs> on its own, logically perfect systems of axioms and rules of, it, rules of inference. And the key technical tool here would be the predicate calculus, the uh, uh, Hilbert and Ackerman. So you, you have to, in other words, you, you write down certain precise symbolic rules for what's allowed finitistically, and then you write another set of rules for what's allowed finitistically or infinitistically. Uh, and, and you do this in a precise way, and that, that was within reach to do that. So, second step is embed the finitistic system as a, a subsystem of the infinitistic system, and that's also easy to do. So these two steps had already been accomplished, essentially, by the late 1920s. But then the third step is to prove finitistically, by manipulating these symbols, that any finitistically meaning, meaningful conclusion, which is deducible in the non-finitistic system, would also be deducible in the finitistic system. So that's what he meant by reduction. In other words, the idea was that the actual infinities are harmless but convenient fictions. That it's okay to use them, even though they don't really exist, because anything they tell us about the real world will be true, will be observable. It's, it's kind of like Santa Claus, right? You tell, you tell somebody about Santa Claus, and, you know, they don't have to know whether Santa Claus exists or not. As long as the Christmas presents are under the tree, it's okay. That, that's, I, well, that's, that's a poor analogy. <laughs> but, um, I just, I, I, I know I should have stuck to my script. Um, but because of this reduction, the idea is that mathematicians would then have full license to use actual infinities freely. They could, they could talk about actual infinities, uh, you know, uh, inaccessible cardinals, everything else, and they could, um, they would, the, the actual infinities would be guaranteed to be harmless because we, we'd know in advance, uh, by proving it in advance, that they could never contaminate the finitistically meaningful core of mathematics. They could never tell us anything that wasn't already finitistically justified. That's, that's, that's finitistically meaningful. So, in short, <coughs> get a drink of water. So, in short, when it comes to the question of potential infinity versus actual infinity in mathematics, Hilbert was riding to the rescue. He was proposing a bold, sophisticated, far-reaching plan to compromise between finitism and non-finitism. He wanted mathematicians to have it both ways, to have our cake and eat it too. In other words, we, we could be both finitists and non-finitists at the same time. Uh, and this proposal is known as Hilbert's program, or in a more technical vein, finitistic reductionism. The full statement is of this program is spelled out in his 1926 essay on the infinite. So it's called finitistic reductionism. You reduce the infinite to the finite. You reduce the actual infinities to potential infinities, basically. Uh, so then, so that was in 1926. Uh, this is, you know, of course, this was all brewing a long time before that. But then five years later, in 1931, Gödel came along. his famous paper proving that Hilbert's program is impossible to carry out in its entirety. The work of Gödel revealed, in fact, a hierarchy 
of stronger and stronger formal mathematical systems, uh, again based on the predicate calculus, requiring more and more extent, re relying more and more extensively on actual infinities, leading to more and more consequences which are finitistically meaningful but not finitistically verifiable. In other words, he showed that no, the, these actual infinities actually do have consequences that are not finitistically verifiable. Um, so, uh, there, here's, let's see, uh, oh, here's, uh, yeah, here's some text on it. So, and just, just in a nutshell, Hilbert was proposing to use the tools of mathematical logic, which he had largely developed himself, to prove that all of mathematics is re including the infinitistic parts of mathematics, is reducible to purely finitistic mathematics, that is, mathematics that only appeals to potential infinity. In this way, the objectivity of mathematics would be confirmed, because potential infinities are objectively true, and they're real, they refer to real world things. Um, now, Gödel's refutation of this was to use mathematical logic to prove that some parts of infinitistic mathematics are not reducible. And this includes the medium and strong levels of the Gödel hierarchy, this is a bit technical, and thus the objectivity of mathematics is left in doubt. So this was, I think that's what Klein was talking about when he said mathematics, the loss of certainty. Um, so here's a picture of the Gödel hierarchy. This is all technical, I'm not going to explain all this, but, but there are, um, this is a hierarchy of these stronger and stronger systems. The, the systems farther up um, use more and more uh, actual infinities that are, that are more and more remote from actual real world experience. Uh, that's, that's all I can say about it. And um, so there, the, so Gödel showed already at this uh, sort of medium strong, you know, if we're just using a little bit of actual <coughs> infinities, uh, you're getting non-finitistic consequences. So, uh, so this discovery by Gödel was viewed as a complete and total defeat for mathematical finitism. The mathematical world seemed to be left with only two options. The two options were, <coughs> We could either cling to objectivity by rejecting all non-finitistic methods, or we could abandon objectivity by embracing the panorama of actual infinities. So we just, just accept all the actual infinities, just work with them, and not worry about it. Don't worry. Be happy. So, so um, and, and mathematicians were, by that time, quite comfortable with actual infinities. And so they almost universally chose the second option. We'll, we'll, we'll just use the actual infinities freely. That's, their, that's how they reacted to this. So, so Hilbert's program was dead, according to this theory. So, so finitism, finitistic reducibility, and objectivity in mathematics were now apparently out the window. Even today, Despite modern advances, the popular wisdom, or quote-unquote, settled science, is that Gödel's theorems mean the end of Hilbert's program and the end of objectivity in mathematics. So that's, this is a, this is a big, big time foundational crisis here. Now, um, in this title of this lecture, I promised, so, all right, so that's where we stand. Now, I promised an optimistic message so let me report on some results of modern research dating from the 1970s to the present. And the big discovery, or actually from some of this goes back to the 1920s, the big discovery here is that despite Gödel, or the 30s I guess, despite Gödel, a large and significant part of Hilbert's program can in fact be carried out with brilliant success. So Hilbert's program isn't it, it does, it's not dead at all. It's, it's limping along. Maybe it can't do everything <laughs> you thought it could do. But, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not dead. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's actually getting healthier. 
So to explain how this can be so, despite girdle, uh, let me return to the girdle hierarchy while I'm already at it. So there are two important points to make. The first point is that Hilbert's program can actually be carried out just as Hilbert envisioned it for these weak levels of the girdle hierarchy. Uh, you can actually carry it out using exactly the methods that Hilbert pioneered, proof theoretic methods. Uh, another name is Genson, of course, but and, uh, follower of Hilbert. Uh, so yeah, I mean Hilbert and his followers, uh, you know, you can use their methods to actually carry out Hilbert's program for these these systems, and these systems are infinitistic. These, especially these two systems here, they they involve actual infinities, but. You can eliminate the actual infinities and show that any finitistically meaningful thing that you prove using them could have, could have been proved another way finitistically without using any actual infinities. So this is, uh, that's, that's very positive. And the second point is that <clears throat> this, this part of mathematics down here, these weak systems, is actually where a lot of the action is in mathematics. A lot of mathematics can be done within these weak systems, these so-called weak systems. It's actually very strong systems. They can do a lot of mathematics. Um, so uh, this is where reverse mathematics comes in. I guess I thought uh, Professor Chung has already given you a little introduction to it. Um, so beginning in the 1970s and continuing through the present, mathematical logicians have carried out a series of foundational case studies known as reverse mathematics. The goal is to determine which levels of the girdle hierarchy are essential for the formalization of which parts of mathematics, as you take a piece of mathematics and try to place it in this hierarchy. And this is a huge and ongoing research program. Um, it's, as Professor Chong said, it's the subject of a workshop here at uh, NUS in the Institute for Mathematical Sciences this week and next. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, a, wide, a, a big research program worldwide. And as an outcome of re reverse mathematics, we now know that the bulk of mathematics, uh, including a great deal of non-finitistic mathematics, can in fact be formalized at these weak levels. Uh, and there's great advances right at this conference being announced uh, and, and, and verified. Um, in this, in this direction. Um, this is an ongoing project, but I estimate that it applies to something like 85 to 95 percent of mathematics as it exists today. Of course, there's no way to assign a percentage to this, but that's just how, that's just based on a lot of experience with this. And, um, uh, and, and this includes this part that, he'll, that we can uh, take care of includes not only constructive or computable mathematics, but also a great deal of highly non-constructive mathematics. So some care is needed, but the optimistic message is that by focusing on these weak levels of the girdle hierarchy, so-called weak levels, we can uh, carry out Hilbert's program for a big chunk of mathematics, something like 85%. So, uh, so Hilbert's program lives. So what I'm suggesting is, to summarize the summary, even though Hilbert's program cannot be carried out in its entirely because of Gödel, uh, because of Gödel's discoveries, there is a less sweeping version which can be carried out and which represents the proper balance between the finite and the infinite in mathematics. So it's a question of finding the right balance. Now, another project for the next century maybe is to find the right balance between the finite and the infinite in other areas such as theology. That's another subject. Okay. Thank you.
Anybody? Yeah, well, you see, to really find that out, you have to master the proof of the of, of a theorem, like Fermat, the proof of Fermat's theorem. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, I, I believe the best guess at this point, because it hasn't been, nobody's really carried out the logical, see, often the logical analysis of, of the proof of a theorem is, is, is 10 times longer than the proof itself. So uh, it hasn't been carried out entirely. Uh, oh, of course, the program of form actually putting mathematics onto digital computers can help. But uh, the best educated guess, I think, is that it falls at these very low levels here, uh, elementary function arithmetic. That's, that's just uh, not, not been checked, but that's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not an exception to, to this, to what I'm saying. That's a very good good question. I mean, you know, we, we we haven't. There's not enough of. So there's an army of <clears throat> there's an army of reverse mathematicians, but there's the army isn't big enough. It isn't it isn't it isn't ten times as big as the army of mathematicians, which which you would need to, to really do this entirely for all of mathematics. You know, to to figure out which parts of mathematics are finitistically reducible and which parts are not. just based on experience over the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Yes? Um, thank you very much. Uh, you have a lot from the history. It's all fascinating. Um, you seem to suggest that uh, in the modern view, what Wigner said about the unreasonable usefulness of mathematics is sort of out of faith. Say something more about the modern view. Is uh, he wrong now? And what is the evidence? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's actually pretty uh, weak at this point, but I think it could be strengthened. Um, I mean, uh, you know, to, to see, uh, I mean, the, the main, the point that I, uh, the point is that if a piece of mathematics is finitistically reducible, that is, uh, and, and that's the case at these low levels of the girdle hierarchy, then it has some objective basis. That is, there's some, something going on in reality that uh, suggests that this should be true. That's about all we can say right now. So, uh, so you know, and I, I think of you know a lot of mathematical physics probably can be probably falls into this category. So, but it doesn't mean that we're not making any mistakes in physics or that at all. <laughs> it doesn't justify string theory or anything like that. It's, it doesn't say the string theory is really true. It's, it, you know, it's, there's nothing. There's nothing like. It. There just hasn't been enough research on this to, to say something like that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, that's the best I can do. I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer. Yes? So you mentioned about mechanizing a lot of these, uh, these, these proofs. Yes. Um, what results in, in computer science, for example, would help the most to speed up this process? there's an army of people, but that's not enough. Uh, well, there's, a, there's another army of people who are uh, engaged in uh, what's called automatic theorem proving. That is, uh, well, uh, the computers can't actually prove theorems at this point. What they can do is, take, mostly, is take an existing proof of a mathematical theorem, a human readable, human proof, and help to convey, the, 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 with, with a little help from, with, with a lot of help, actually, from humans, the computer can uh, develop a fully formalized proof of the, of the same theorem, and based on the original, based on the outline provided by the original proof. So, uh, so there are many uh, groups of researchers doing this. There's uh, you know, uh, proof assistants, as they're called, for pieces of thick pieces of software that that do this stuff pretty well. And this is, uh, uh, you know, 
this is now starting to show results. I mean, a lot of very uh, highly technical theorems in, in mathematics have now have fully formalized proof. It was always clear that this could be done, but, but now people are actually doing it, and, and that's good. Um, we were discussing this at a conference, and uh, one, one uh, uh, thing that was brought to my attention is that uh, some mathematicians actually doubt their own proofs. You know, their, their proofs are so complicated, they just lay awake at night thinking, maybe I made a mistake somewhere in this proof, you know. And they'd love it, they'd actually like it if, if somebody could give a fully formalized proof, because then they would know it's correct. But, but you know, that day is coming. So the process of actually writing to cough or one of these yes. clear proving systems, can that be mechanized? Uh, you know, I'm not, I, I tell you, I'm not, it's not my area. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on the theorem provers. Uh, there, there are some experts, uh, some, well, some people who know more than I do about it here uh, at our conference at IMS. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, it's an intriguing area. And, and there, there are diff there's a lot of discussion of different approaches to do it. I, I don't know how far along they are in the direction you're saying. Yes? Hi, uh, can, I, can you give us a sample of the types of theorems or results that are not uh, statistically reducible? Uh, yes. 15% uh, that we can talk about. Let's see. Um, well, uh, let's see. Oh, gosh. Uh, there's, there's, there, there's not, uh, like I said, uh, the, uh, so, so I mean, there are there are examples. Many examples have been worked out. Um, let's see, uh, one example. Hmm. Um, I would say, um, well, it, it's an example from graph theory. Um, there's a theorem called the Kernig duality theorem, which says that if you have a finite bipartite graph, then there's a uh, Vertex. Let's see. There's a. There's a. There's. A, let's say there's a. There's a vertex coloring. No, the there's, vertex. There's okay. a matching. Okay. There's a. There, yeah. There's a. There's a matching, and a vertex a, a set of vertices that includes exactly one edge of each. Uh, a vertex covering meaning meaning a set of vertices that, that uh, includes at least one endpoint of each edge, and there's the the the, the, uh, the vertex covering is included in the edges of this match. So it's it's a it's a basic theorem in graph theory. It's sort of a minimax theorem in graph theory, and this holds for finite graphs, and that's no problem doing it at the lowest levels. But uh, it also holds for um, infinite graphs. And that, that's, a, that's an example of a theorem of a theorem that cannot be proved finitistically in, in any finitistically acceptable way. Um, I don't know. Um, how about, uh, oh, yeah, there, there are lots of examples. Um, uh, how about uh, the theorem that any closed set in, uh, in the, uh, in the <coughs> space consists of a perfect set, that's a set which is, uh, every point is a limit point, and a countable set. Every, every, every closed set consists of a perfect closed set plus, plus a countable set. That's, you know, it's just a theorem about the structure of sets of points in Euclidean space. Too explicitly, but but 
it's potential infinity. It's you can you can compute it to an arbitrary degree of approximation, and so you know you can approximate it uh, as well as you would like. But as a whole, as a whole, you cannot. Right. So so as an actual infinity, you, you uh, it, it's it's doubtful. But it's potentially we can compute as much of it as we want.